Yeah, thank you very much for the introduction and for this uh, possibility to speak in this uh, LQP colloquium. I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, some aspects of algebraic quantum field theory named local covariance and dynamics. And um, so let me explain what I intend to uh, talk about. So these are some of these aspects are no, more or less 20 years old, others are rather new. And let me start. So I, oh, I start with some general remarks on quantum field theory. As you all know, quantum field theory is closely related to particle physics. But I think what one should emphasize is that this is a connection which is not really fundamental. Namely, if you have quantum field theory and use the HQL theory, then you can explain this connection as a consequence of the local structure of quantum field theory, but under additional assumptions, including Poincare symmetry, existence of one particle states, and positivity of energy in the mass gap. And how important these uh, additional uh, assumptions are is becomes evident when you look for the situation where you have external fields, in particular for gravitational fields, which means that one uh, looks at theories at curved space times. And it turns out that in this situation, the particle interpretation is no longer meaningful. Now let me just review uh, the, the um, structure of algebraic quantum field theory, also synonymously called local quantum physics because of this emphasis on locality. So we have an association of operator algebras to space-time regions. And there's a tip, this well-known Hacastle axiom, so the inclusion relation, uh, local commutativity, and the covariance relation. So these are um, quite well known uh, axioms and they look very uh, general. Now, when you uh, apply these axioms to the situation of Minkowski space, then you can do more. Then, we, then you can use the Poincare group for the interpretation of states. So for instance, when you have an invariant state with positive energy, you interpret it as a vacuum. Actually, this is in a sense uh, a misnaming because the vacuum, uh, so a state with these properties is by no means empty, as you can see, for instance, in the Casimir effect. But uh, in the sense, it's the best uh, approach to the concept of a vacuum, which we know in quantum field theory. But it really relies on Poincare symmetry. And then uh, when you come to particles, you have the similar situation. So you, uh, in the, such a, in the corresponding GNS representation, you can implement Poincare symmetry and uh, you look for irreducible representations of the Poincaré group and identify them with particle states. And then you can start with the Hacquel scattering theory and get the outgoing or incoming multi-particle states. So this is quite satisfactory, but I, I want to emphasize that it really relies not only on the principle of locality, but also on the special symmetries of Minkowski space. And there is no possibility to generalize this to arbitrary space times. Okay, now what to do to, when one wants to generalize the framework of algebraic quantum field theory to curved space times. So, uh, of course, uh, space, curved space times can be quite uh, strange. So here we want to concentrate on space times which have a reasonable causal structure. 
these are globally hyperbolic space times, so space times which still have a Cauchy surface. And then you try to generalize the Hakasle axioms to this framework. And you look at the axioms, you have this inclusion axiom, which is, uh, of course, uh, trivial. Uh, then there is a local commutativity axiom, which also makes perfect sense on such a, a globally hyperbolic space time. You can also formulate the covariance axiom, but unfortunately, this becomes, in the generic case, trivial. And as a consequence, as I already mentioned, there is no good concept of vacuum and of particles, in spite of a lot of attempts. No, so nobody has found a concept, uh, a good definition of a vacuum state or of the particle states on a curved space time. Then there is another problem which occurs when you really try to uh, uh, construct specific theories then you, as always in quantum field theory, you have to deal with a lot of singularities and you can try to uh, master these singularities by the known methods of renormalization theory. The problem is in the absence of symmetry, there are huge ambiguities in renormalization because you can do this at every point on its own. So the singularities at different points would be unrelated. And this was a big uh, obstacle and it has been solved by a new concept which was then uh, called locally covariant quantum field theory. And I think the breakthrough, breakthrough was done in a mini workshop in Oberwolfer in the year 2000 and I list here a number of people who contributed to this new concept. First one should mention in particular Bernard Kay, who uh, had a paper on the Casimir effect much earlier where the similar ideas were already presented. But the generalization to, which, uh, to the general case was done in this um, meeting in Oberwolfer and, and the papers which were published afterwards. Now, what is a locally covariant quantum field theory? So a locally covariant quantum field theory is defined not as a net, as a Hakastel net, but as a functor. So a slight generalization of a net. So we have uh, two categories. One is the category of globally hyperbolic space times of a fixed dimension. If you take as morphisms, the causality preserving isometric embeddings. And the category of operator algebras, say C star algebras. And there you take usually the unital monomorphisms as morphisms. And then you need an axiom expressing local commutativity. So when you have an embedding of space times mi into an other space time n, such that the images of chi1 and chi2 are space like to each other then the corresponding um, algebras should compute, which, which is which is algebra. And this is really a generalization of the Hakastler net, namely when you restrict this category to the globally hyperbolic subregions of a fixed space time, you get a Hakastler net satisfying the Hakastler axioms. What is a nice aspect is that in spite of the fact that this is more general, you need less axioms because the covariance and the inclusion follow from the same property, namely from the functoriality, uh, from, from the properties of the functor. It's just the covariance of the functor, which includes covariance and inclusion. Now this can be used and this was then uh, uh, possible by combining this with uh, a lot of analysis, micro-local analysis in particular, to show that quantum field theory on curved space time can be renormalized. Now uh, um, I want to 
emphasize an additional axiom, which is also uh, important in the Hakastler framework, but which becomes especially important in this framework. This is a time slice axiom. This is an axiom which characterizes the existence of a dynamical law and has a form that you, for, uh, if you have an embedding of a space time M into a space time N, such that the image of M contains a Cauchy surface of N, then these uh, monomorphisms of algebras is actually an isomorphism. And this has very nice consequences, namely, you can then look at formal inverses of such an embedding. So this uh, is, uh, uh, of course, uh, can be formulated in terms of model categories where you have the so-called weak equivalences which have formal inverses. And on the level of the algebras, these formal inverses really become inverses because they have isomorphisms and you can form close paths of weak equivalences and they then induce automorphisms which describe intermediate changes of the metric. So you can find an automorphism of the theory, which depends on a change of the metric. And when you look at the infinitesimal action um, by of changing the metric, you get the action of the energy momentum tensor in the sense of derivations. And because the whole framework is general covariant, you find that this energy momentum tensor is covariantly conserved. So in spite of the fact that no action was used, uh, it's just from the geometric setup that you can derive these uh, properties. Okay, but there is an important open problem here, namely, these are general properties of quantum field theory, but they don't characterize a given model. So how can we describe a specific model in this framework. Now let's first have a look at standard method of canonical quantization. So we start from Lagrangian of classical field theory of a scalar field for simplicity and uh, we take as the space of smooth field configurations just the C infinity functions. Then the Lagrangian is a density valued functional on the jet space of the, of the, uh, of the field. And it, uh, it has typically the form written there that uh, we have the metric, the inverse metric on the derivative of the field uh, minus some potential which depends on the field times the density d mu g which is the density from uh, coming from the space-time metric g then you uh, we make ordinary canonical quantization so we foliate our manifolds by cauchy surfaces and we do it in such a way that the metric can be written in this simple form where the time uh, uh, dt squared and uh, the, the uh, space part are completely separated. This is always possible. So we have the metric G is uh, uh, a, the scale factor A squared dt squared minus some Riemannian metric on the Cauchy surface sigma. Now we uh, um, write the Lagrangian density as a density on the on sigma times dt. And we have the normal derivative, which is proportional to the time derivative of the field. We have the canonical momentum, which is the derivative with respect to the normal derivative of phi. And this is just uh, the time derivative of phi times the density induced by the metric on sigma. And then one has requires canonical commutation relations, 
commutator phi with pi at equal times is just the Dirac measure at the point x times i. Now, um, what I think uh, sh should be uh, uh, remarked here is that this algebraic structure is really independent of the metric on sigma. So in spite of the fact that the metric on sigma is time dependent, the algebraic structure is always the same. And this, uh, then it's meaningful to write down the uh, Heisenberg equation for the time evolution, which is then uh, the integral of the commutator of the Hamiltonian density with some uh, element of the algebra. And the Hamiltonian density has this usual form. Now it's really a density on sigma. Okay, this is just a brief review on, on canonical quantization. And it's uh, in a sense beautiful and elegant, but it has a lot, a lot of problems when you try to give a meaning to the operators which occur in this formalism. Because the tendency for all these quantities is that they do not really exist as operators. And so it remains, unfortunately, rather formal. And it would be nice to replace it by something which is less uh, sensitive. And um, so what one can do is the following. One looks at uh, additional density little f here, which is a function of phi and of the space-time points. This defines a new functional on the field. And um, we interpret this as an additional interaction. Then we can form the S matrix generated by this additional interaction. And for this, we have just the usual Dyson series where we insert in, as argument in the function f just the solution of the Heisenberg equation for the Hamiltonian. Now, we can find causal factorization. What does it mean? We can split our interaction at some intermediate time t. So we have an interaction before the time t and after the time t. And then this S matrix also splits into a factor of two. Now this can be then formulated in a slightly uh, uh, different way. Then we take now three such functionals, F, G, and H, such that support F is in the future and support H is in the past of some Cauchy surface. And then we can make this, uh, this split at this Cauchy surface, which is parameterized by this uh, value of T. And then we insert the factor one twice and multiply it in a different way together and get this nice factorization formula, S of F plus G, times s of g to the minus one times s of g plus h. Now what is the advantage of this formula? The advantage of this formula is that now we can forget the splitting into, into um, uh, these um, different, different uh, Cauchy surfaces. So the, the relation which we found is independent of any uh, splitting of space, uh, of the space time into space and time. And unfortunately, this is still not specific to the dynamics, but it's an important property of the dynamics and it, divide, and it avoids these problems which you get by fixing a fixed, uh, 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 if you want to restrict your observables to a fixed uh, Cauchy surface. Now, how can we specify the dynamics? Now, the dynamics can be uh, fixed in the following way. Now, uh, we, we shift 
our field phi by adding another uh, smooth function psi, where we take a function psi with compact support. And this produces an isomorphic theory if we do the same transformation with the Lagrangian. So in the argument of the Lagrangian, we also add this function psi and get an equivalent theory. But we can now do also something different. Namely, we can consider the difference between the shifted Lagrangian and the original one as an interaction. And uh, we then use the formula uh, for interactions, namely the formula to get the interacting theory is you, you, uh, you, you form this uh, uh, expression here, you take the inverse of the S matrix of the interaction times the S matrix where you act at the interaction to the functional. And what we find by this method is we find an automorphism of the original theory. Yeah? Before we had, we had two isomorphisms, an isomorphism coming from the shift and an isomorphism by uh, using this interaction. And, but uh, together we get an automorphism of the original theory. Moreover, when we look at uh, the situation where the support of psi is in the future, the support of f is in the past of some Cauchy surface, then the uh, then, then you can use this factorization rule. So in this formula, you can uh, uh, just write this as a product of the interaction times the, times the um, functional itself. So what you, and the functional is, uh, if the functional uh, has a different support from the support of psi, then this is, this field, uh, the functional does not feel this translation by psi. So in this situation, you find that alpha of S of F is equal to S of F. So the automorphism acts trivial on such functionals. But when we have the time slice axiom, this means that actually alpha itself is trivial, is an identity. So we found by these arguments an identity within our algebra. Now let's look at a special situation. Namely, take for your uh, functional capital F, the shift, the, the uh, difference delta L of psi prime from other function psi prime. And then, then you, uh, you use the relation we found before and I uh, multiply from the left with S of delta L of psi. So I get this for the left hand side and on the right hand side, you get this combination. Let me, uh, this, this sum of these two terms and if you uh, uh, use the fact that the delta L of psi is the difference of these two terms, you get that this is just delta L of the sum of psi and psi prime. So you see that we have a group relation. So the uh, additive group of these test functions is uh, um, mapped into a product of the corresponding S matrix. In particular, we can look at a one parameter group yeah, where we multiply psi by uh, some real number lambda. And this is one parameter group and the generator is nothing else than the field equation, the derivative of the action in the direction of this test function psi. So provided the equation of motion holds, we have 
that the S matrix of this expression is equal to one. This was the reason for that the Buchholz and myself to, prop, to make the proposal that one, instead of using canonical quantization, one should define the quantum theory by these two axioms. Namely, we have a Lagrangian L, we have unitaries S of F for all compactly supported local functionals of phi. We set S of zero equal one. And then the unitaries are supposed to fulfill uh, two relations. One relation is this uh, causal factorization, which I mentioned before, which is, uh, was used in perturbation theory since long. And the other is this relation which really involves the Lagrangian of the theory. Now, uh, when you use these axioms and uh, assume in, in addition that these S matrices are in some sense uh, um, differentiable, then you can derive the perturbative framework of quantum field theory. Actually, this first relation is just the relation from which the renormalization method of Epstein and Glaser starts. And the second relation is, uh, turns out to be equivalent to the Schwinger-Dyson equation. And actually in perturbation theory, both relations hold. Okay, now perturbation theory is nice and uh, you can do a lot of this, but there's also an unsatisfactory uh, property of perturbation theory, namely in the most cases, you only have formal power series. And so in order to uh, get definite results, which you can uh, compare to experiments, you have to truncate your perturbation, uh, your, your power series. And uh, because it's a formal power series, you have in general no control over errors. Therefore, we tried to understand whether one can uh, instead look at the C star algebra generated by the S matrix, because these are unitary elements of some algebra. So they fulfill some relations, which are also uh, formulated completely in terms of unitaries. So there is a unique C star algebra defined by these relations. And the question is, is this useful? Now, the first thing one observes is that because of this um, algebraic relation, maybe I show it again here, you have this relation. So assume that G is equal to zero and F and H are space-like localized with each other. Then the left-hand side is, of course, symmetric in F and H. And so you see on the right-hand side that the corresponding operators have to commute. So you get local commutativity for free. And covariance is also obvious because these relations are covariant. So uh, you get the Harkastler net for any given Lagrangian. But there is uh, more structure, namely what you can find is the following. When you restrict yourself to the free Lagrangian, up to now this was an, uh, any Lagrangian of the form I mentioned before. But now let's take the free Lagrangian, which means that your, your potential is a quadratic expression in phi. And look at functionals capital F which are linear in the field plus some constant. Then you can already compute the product just from these axioms. Namely, what you find is the following. You take two such S matrices and you get the S matrix of the sum of these two uh, densities F and G. 
plus these constants, plus an additional constant, which is formed in terms of the advanced propagator for the equation of motion of the Lagrangian. And you can easily reformulate this relation in such a way that this gives the viral relation. So what you, what you get is that the, uh, as a consequence of the proposed axioms, you get automatically the viral relations and therefore also the canonical commutation relations. And even in, you get it in wire form, so this is much nicer than in the canonical quantization where you have un, uh, operator value distributions and when you smear them, you have unbounded operators, so you have to worry about domains and things like this. Here you directly have um, um, the, vial, uh, the vial operators directly. Moreover, the vial algebra satisfies the time slice axiom. And we also have a well understood family of states. Of course, we have sister algebra, so we always know that there, there are um, many states, sufficiently many, but we, in general, we do not know much about um, the behavior of the states. But here for the vial algebra, we understand the state space very well. In particular, we have all the quasi-free or Gaussian states, which can be used for all kinds of purposes. The question is then, can one extend the induced representation to the full algebra? And actually, this is now the existence problem of constructive quantum field theory. So it's no longer the question whether the theory exists, in the sense of these uh, nets of CISA algebra, the theory always exists. The question is, how, what are the properties of the representation? And the usual construction uh, requires that the, uh, the full algebra is uh, represented on the space where the field itself is represented. And in this framework, it would mean that you have the representation of the vial algebra, and in the same representation, you can find also the other S matrices. Okay, now there comes some bad news. Namely, the extension is unfortunately, provided it exists, it is not unique in general. And actually, one had to be aware of this just from our knowledge of perturbation theory, namely, uh, we know that there is some renormalization freedom in perturbation theory. So we, in addition to the Lagrangian, we have to fix certain renormalization constants and they correspond to different theories. And here we uh, see this in this phenomenon that the extension is not unique. This can be uh, completely uh, clarified in a simple situation, namely when you restrict yourself to quadratic functionals. This can be analyzed in, uh, in a Fock representation, usual Fock representation of the vacuum. And there you see you can find these uh, S matrices for quadratic functionals but they are not unique. You can modify them by multiplying them with a phase, provided this phase does not disturb the relations which were required before. And I wrote this crucial relation here that the, the, uh, the, this phase must satisfy this factorization relation, but now we the restriction that this holds provided the intersection of the supports of these two functionals is empty. This is in a recent paper by uh, Detlef Buchholz and myself. So this is uh, the fact of life. And in particular, what is uh, a problem? The time slice axiom does not hold on our full algebra. 
It holds on the vial algebra, on the subalgebra, but it does not hold on the full algebra because of this freedom. Okay. Now let's come to an application of this framework, which is rather recent. Actually, this is work in progress with uh, Romeo Brunetti, Michael Dutsch, and Kasia Reisner. And it's related to the problem of deriving Noether's theorem in the framework of quantum field theory. Now, as we all know, that uh, uh, symmetries and conservation laws are intimately connected by Noether's theorem. And in quantum field theory, this connection is a little bit weaker. There can be anomalies. And the question is, can one understand this connection also in this C-star algebraic setting? Now, uh, this uh, one can try to, to formulate this in terms of uh, representation within pass integrals, but usually it's very difficult to make this rigorous. Here one turns out that it's better to enrich this formalism of locally covariant quantum field series by admitting additional arrows. And uh, formulated here, for scalar field, and uh, uh, it's me, uh, useful to have a, a field with several components. So we take a slightly richer category, which uh, are called dynamical category. And the objects are now space times, M, Lagrangians, L, and uh, time, uh, uh, time orientation. So uh, if you compare this with this uh, locally covariant framework, we, uh, there, uh, we had the metric, which is already also present here in the Lagrangian. But here we take the full dynamics, not just the dynamics uh, um, induced only by the metric. So, uh, so this, this uh, uh, dynamical space times have a little bit more structure. The, the time orientation we need in anyhow. This, this was also important in the locally covariant framework. Now on this category, we have several morphisms and uh, the elementary morphisms are these embeddings the same as in the locally covariant framework. And the Lagrangians then should just be related so in such a way that the pullback, so chi is a, an a embedding of M into M prime, and the pullback of chi uh, applied to the Lagrangian L prime is L, and the, uh, the uh, time orientations coincide. In addition, we consider uh, field-free definitions. And we restrict ourselves to field-free definitions of the following form. So we uh, have a shift of the field, as discussed before. In addition, we allow a linear transformation of the field. So A is just the matrix depending on the space-time point. And he, in this case, the manifolds are the same, M prime is equal to M, and the Lagrangians are connected by this field redefinition. In the literature, you find uh, field redefinitions of a more general form, but this is problematic because then the Lagrangian changes its form. It's no longer of the simple form mentioned at the beginning, and this creates other problems which are not under control. So here we restrict ourselves to affine field redefinitions. Actually, one has to be careful in addition that the metric term is not too much distorted by this, because then you get problems. So, so um, this was analyzed in the paper with uh, Detlef Buchholz. And then we consider additional arrows coming 
from interaction. So we look at a Lagrangian which differs by an interaction, and we can consider two different cases. One is that the interaction happens in the future. So the support of V is past compact, or it happens essentially in the past. So this is support V is future compact. And both cases we associate uh, with these interactions uh, certain arrows. And then as before, we consider our quantum field theory as a functor between the category of dynamical space times into the category of C star algebras. And the C star algebra is again, as before, the C star algebra generated by the S matrices S of F and by the relation causal factorization and dynamics. Okay, then we have to describe this functor. So we have to say, um, how these um, uh, arrows in the category of dynamical space times are mapped to homomorphisms between algebras. And I use here this uh, notation that I apply this functor to this yota, this index, I call this alpha, this index. So if we have this arrow corresponding to an embedding, this is just the push forward of the uh, uh, function uh, functional f by this diffeomorphism. This is the situation we have in the locally covariant framework. Then we use this field redefinition, and there we map s of f into s of f times phi to the minus one. And then we have these two arrows corresponding to the interaction. So one is the retarded interaction. There we multiply with the inverse of the S matrix of the interaction times S of the interaction plus F. Now we did not assume that the S, the interaction has compact support. So we have to introduce some cutoff here, but it's sufficient that this cutoff is equal to this cutoff function F is equal to one on a sufficiently large region, depending on the localization of the function capital F. Then it uh, does no longer depend on uh, the choice of this cutoff function little, little f. The same holds in the other case when you have a future compact interaction, then you get uh, just the advanced uh, representation of the interaction. So these are these elementary arrows and then uh, general arrows are just composition of these elementary arrows. So you get a lot of connections in this, uh, in this category and we want to play a little bit with these uh, different relations. Now let's G upper index C denotes a group generated by diffeomorphisms and affine field array definitions, but now I assume that all of them have compact support. So this means the diffeomorphism is uh, the identity up to some compact uh, set. And in these affine field array definitions, this matrix valued function capital A and this shift by this uh, test func uh, te uh, function phi not are both compactly supported. We and we look now at the case where the two space times coincide. So M prime is equal to M. And they, the Lagrangians are connected by the, uh, the action of the group element G, so this combination of field tree definition and, uh, and diffeomorphism, and the, and the uh, time orientation is not changed. And then, as before, we look at the difference of the transformed Lagrangian and the original Lagrangian, and call it delta GL. 
And in this, uh, in this uh, category, we now have two arrows, uh, several arrows. Let me, we have an arrow corresponding to this group element G from M to M prime. But we have also an arrow induced by this interaction. This is an interaction with compact support. So we have the arrow, the retarded and the advanced arrow. And these are arrows from M prime to M. Now we can combine these two arrows and get an arrow from M to M. And it, the corresponding arrow on, on the category C star is a product of these two uh, two isomorphisms, alpha g times alpha delta g r plus minus. So we get automorphisms of our original algebra. And they have this form, alpha plus of s of f, uh, you have s of delta g l to the minus one, s of delta g l plus g uh, lower star f, so this is a push forward of f. And uh, in the advanced case, we just put this interaction on the other side. Okay, now we look again uh, at the situation where the support of this uh, transformation G and the support of this functional capital F are separated but by, a, by a Cauchy surface. Then we can apply the causal factorization and conclude that S of F is equal to um, S of G, um, uh, S of delta G, no, I'm sorry. Then we conclude that alpha plus of S of F is equal to S of F. So the alpha plus minus is then the identity. Now, if uh, F is a linear functional of the field, we can use the fact that the time slice axiom holds on the Weyl algebra. So in this case, we know that these uh, automorphisms alpha plus minus are equal to the identity. So in the Weyl algebra, these automorphisms are the identity. And in case the, uh, we can have this as an identity, this is just the uniform, the, the unitary version of the so-called master word identity, which was uh, proposed in uh, perturbation theory and analyzed by Dutch and uh, collaborators some years ago. And, uh, and there it was found that this master word identity does not always hold. So sometimes the general form is the so-called anomalous mod master word identity. And in this, uh, C star framework just, just means that the anomalous mass about identity corresponds to this formula uh, in the situation where this um, automorphism is not the identity. Okay, now the question is what can we do in the situation? where um, um, when we want to analyze what happens with these automorphisms on more general functionals than the linear functionals. So we are interested in automorphisms of our algebra, which act trivial on the Weyl algebra. Unfortunately, at the moment, we don't know how these automorphisms can look like. We only know examples. But we make an ansatz here. Namely, the ansatz is that it's given by a renormalization group element. So that the um, automorphism alpha of S of F is just S of Z of F, where Z is an element of the renormalization group. And the renormalization group in this framework is characterized by a few conditions. So yeah, z of zero should be zero. This might be also changed, but uh, let's assume this for the moment. 
we assume that it maps local functionals to local functionals. So that of F is again local. And you uh, assume that the support of the new functional is equal to the support of the old functional. Moreover, you require this, uh, uh, this additivity rule. So that of the sum of three functionals can be split it in this way, provided the support of F and the support of H, um, the, the intersection of these two supports is empty. Then we need uh, to have this uh, relation corresponding to the, uh, the Schwinger-Dyson equation, so this dynamical relation. And th so F index, our oh, upper index psi means the, the f shifted by by uh, adding psi to the to the argument phi, and then the uh, of course the z should act trivial on the field itself. This is this formula here. Now, what is the motivation for this uh, assumption for this ansatz? So the motivation is that such a formula does hold in perturbation theory. This is the main theorem on renormalization due to Stora and Popino. Um, I used to say an unpublished paper by Stora and Popino. This is no longer true because posthum it was published. And uh, the dots here are certain improvements of this theorem done by several people, including Gudrun Pinter, uh, Stefan Hollands, uh, Michael Dutsch, and uh, Romeo Brunetti, and myself. Um, it's not clear at the moment whether you can find an argument why this formula holds beyond perturbation theory. So this would be very nice, but at the moment this is just an ansatz. But in perturbation theory at all, so this is a strong motivation. Now we want to apply this to Noether's theorem. So let G denote the group generated by diffeomorphisms and affine field redefinitions without support restrictions. And this group G contains a subgroup which leaves the Lagrangian invariant. Now I'll take an element G in this group which leaves the Lagrangian invariant, so which is in the usual sense a symmetry of the theory, and an uh, uh, element H of this group with compact support, which is in general not a symmetry of the Lagrangian. And, but we uh, choose it in such a way that it, the two actions coincide on uh, at points x, if x is in the support of f or in a slightly larger region, um, which is just the intersection of the future and the past of the support of f. Then the action of g on f and the action of h on f coincide. And moreover, the support of the uh, uh, change of L by H and the support of F, uh, are, um, the, the intersection of the supports is empty. This is just uh, done in such a way because on the support of F, H coincides with G, and G is a symmetry of L, so their, their, uh, L, uh, this expression vanishes. And this is just uh, the reason for this equality. Now we can uh, decompose this difference Lagrangian delta HL. So this has support, not, uh, the support does not uh, intersect the support of F. So you can uh, understand this in such a way there's a region, the support of F, and this region is surrounded by a region which is the support of delta HL. And we decompose now the delta HL into a sum of two terms. One is in the future, 
the support of F, so it has no intersection with the path of support F, and the other is in the path. Of course, the two supports in general will overlap with each other, but they are causally separated from the support of F, both. And then we can use this anomalous uh, mass support identity. We get just uh, now here some element of the renormalization group acting on the functional F. Here we have the delta HL now split it into Q plus and Q minus. And here we have it again, plus the action of G on F. Now we apply these laws of causal separation. So we can, can apply this to the second factor, which gives these three terms. The first two terms cancel. And the last term can again be split because of this uh, causal factorization to product of two terms. So we get this formula. So what we see is that the the um, automorphism induced by this action of G on F is implemented by a unitary, but if ZG is not the identity, it's not, uh, um, it's just an additional transformation. So in case ZG is the identity, this is just means that the automorphism S of F goes into S of G star F is implemented by a unitary. So this unitary is in a sense, the exponentiated charge operator. So, that, so we find that the charge operator exists, the local charge operator exists, implementing the automorphism, provided this renormalization group element is equal to the identity. So this is just the Noether theorem and the question of anomalies is just the question whether by some other choice of the uh, S matrix by acting with this, some other renormalization group element on the S matrix, you can remove this uh, uh, renormalization group element ZG. So this amounts to some, uh, to some co-cycle relation on the renormalization group. And uh, the question whether a certain co-cycle is trivial or not. So this is just the same structure you find in perturbation theory, but now in the CSAR algebraic framework. Okay, so that's what I wanted to tell. So the, the last points, as you have seen, are not really uh, ready. So there's still work in progress. But uh, I think one can say that uh, one can use concepts of algebraic quantum field theories, combine them with ideas from category theory, and this solves some long-standing problems of quantum field theory. There is a new uh, aspect on the, of the problem of existence of quantum field theory. Namely, it's no longer the existence of something which has to be constructed, but it's the question whether the thing we already have constructed have certain properties or not. Then uh, there's this new aspect on symmetries of renormalization. So if we have some possibility to analyze renormalization in this uh, framework of C star algebras. But of course, this uh, requires more work. Then there are some uh, open problems. So the formalism is still restricted to the to a scalar field. And um, so it's not, I think it should be possible to generalize it to Fermi fields, but this has not yet been done. The generalization to gauge theories is a little bit more tricky. So there has been was some work on the QD case, but in the general case, it's not so clear what to do. Actually, this structure is uh, uh, more or less understood, or maybe say well understood in perturbation theory by the BVBRST formalism, but it's at the moment not clear 
how a good CISA algebraic formulation of this framework looks like. Yeah, thank you very much for your attention. Any uh, questions or comments are invited. Uh, one possibility is the chat. Uh, Klaus, do you know where the chat uh, is to be found? Uh, no. No, I think the presenter cannot see the chat, so uh, you would oh. have to read it. Oh, but okay. Then I'll uh, read it. Okay. But you can also ask your question uh, by a microphone. Yeah, there's a question uh, by Kamil Simian. So perhaps oh, I unmute you. Uh, <clears throat> Thank you. Are you hearing me? Yes. So my question is, uh, we know that in flat space, the particle concept have a sense and in the curved space uh, uh, doesn't. I have a question. What was, what is known at this time to the how, how limits from the curved space to flat space uh, uh, is, how to say, uh, if we try to take, if we know anything about, about taking a limit from curved space to uh, flat space and why particles appears in this limit case, uh, in the limit procedure at their case. Uh, okay, that, that is my question. Thank you. Yeah, I, I'm not aware of any systematic um, investigation of this. So, so of course, when you have a free theory, then you can look at a, um, say, at a quasi-free state, and there you, of course, have a, a structure of a Fox space. And uh, if you choose this, uh, your your quasi-free state in a in a nice way, which is in some sense near to the vacuum state on Minkowski space, then you can look at the excitation of the state and interpret them as approximate particles. But uh, I'm not aware of any systematic investigation of this. So, so this would certainly be worthwhile to, to uh, do this, but I'm not aware that anybody has done this. Uh, thank, you. thank you, that was the answer to my question. I don't know how to raise my hand virtually, so I just ask right away. Uh, so can you hear me, Klaus? Yes, I hear you. Ah, perfect, thanks. Um, yeah, I wanted to ask, is there um, a supply of toy models for these uh, functions S, these local S matrices, so that one can investigate, say, existence of vacuum states in a controlled setting, or yeah. is it automatically very complicated? So, um, of course, in theories which are, uh, have less ultraviolet divergences, you uh, can do something. For instance, what we did was we um, uh, constructed the sine gordon model mm -hmm. on this level. So there you can construct these S matrices, they fulfill all these relations. Mm -hmm. And um, unfortunately, we were not yet able to construct the vacuum state. Mm. Which of course is expected to exist, but uh, we have no proof of this. I see. So, oh, so is... but um, but there are a lot of states. So this is not a problem. There are nice states, but uh, it's not clear that uh, how to construct the vacuum state itself. How, if I can just quickly follow up, how do you uh, think about these uh, nets of CISA algebras? say maybe they don't have a vacuum state so how close would that still be to a field theory a quantum field theory in your view yeah so so we have okay. models where you don't have a vacuum state so this is not i think this is just a property of the theory uh, the, uh, so yeah. the standard example is the uh, is the um, massless field in two dimensions which does not have a vacuum state. 
yeah. which nevertheless exists, has nice states, and we actually, this is a representation we use to construct the St. Gordon model. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it's in a sense an infra vacuum, yes? Yeah? So, so you have states which are near to the vacuum, but not exactly equal to the vacuum. Mm. So these states might exist. That's, uh, and these infra vacuum states are also useful in other circumstances, for instance, in pre electrodynamics, where you have a vacuum mm. state, but sometimes these uh, infra vacuum states are better behaved. Mm. Okay, thanks. <coughs> you said that for the Fine Gordon uh, model, you, you, you have the, the algebra at least. Um, what about the uh, two dimensional scalar fields with polynomial interactions? Where polynomial interaction. Yeah, um, there's a situation is unfortunately not completely clarified. There is an old work by Wyszynski to construct these S matrices. Actually, this was the subject of his PhD thesis under uh, the advice of Klaus Hepp. So this was a question which was already analyzed at that time. But uh, the, this model is not under complete control in this respect. Thank you. Yeah, so, so, so St. Gordon is better behaved because there's a uh, perturbation series is convergent. Okay, so I see a further hand raised by Michael Brochner. Uh, well, thanks. Uh, first of all, thank you for uh, sharing this uh, exciting new results. Um, I feel like uh, I'm obliged to ask the obvious question that relates to uh, point two of your outlook. Uh, is there a sort of uh, list of uh, axioms that we can uh, demand for the states that are kind of good? Can we characterize them somehow? Does it give some new perspective on the constructive problem? Um, so, so I think what is uh, most natural in my opinion, is just to start from the vacuum representation of the Weyl algebra and, and ask in this representation whether this S matrix exists for these other functionals. Because then you already can construct the local nets in the vacuum representation of the free theory, the local nets of the interacting theory, just by this formalism of this um, Bogolyubov form of the interacting fields. D uh, this does not solve the question whether the interacting theory possesses a vacuum representation, but it would already give the local von Neumann algebras of these, of these theories. And this is, I think, already, um, I think this is in principle enough because these, uh, you have then a lot of fields and it's a more matter whether the, the model has certain properties. Yeah, so, so you cannot know it before you constructed a model, whether it has a vacuum, whether it has particle structure and so on. So this is something you have to find out when you analyze the theory. So for the, I would say, if you are able to construct the corresponding functionals in the vacuum representation of the Weyl algebra, then you already have constructed the model. Thank you. Okay, a further raised hand by Dan Janssen. Yes, hello. Uh, also, uh, many thanks for the talk. It was, uh, it was very, very lovely. Uh, I had a question. Um, well, at some point you mentioned that uh, uh, the algebra of these S matrices uh, does not satisfy uh, time, the time slicing axiom. Yeah. Of course, in, in classical gauge theories, you basically have a similar situation, which you solve by dividing out uh, gauge orbits. Yeah. Can you also solve it here by dividing out the renormalization freedom in a sense, or is the problem somehow deeper? Um, so, so for the for the situation of a scalar field with a Lagrangian for which the 
classical field would satisfy the time slice axiom. Mm -hmm. There, the uh, viola uh, a violation of the time slice axioms comes by the renormalization. Yes, when you have I a imagine. gauge theory, then already on the classical side, the time slice axiom does not hold. Mm -hmm. It holds only for the, for the uh, say, the gauge invariant quantities. But I can imagine that also here you can divide out these automorphisms generated by uh, by gauge uh, by gauge, gauge or sorry gauge uh, by different renormalization. Uh, um, I don't think that this is allowed in this case. I think this. Um, um, I think uh, the, the, um, be, because this renormalization freedom um, the, fixing the renormalization parameters changes the theory. So if you change mm -hmm. the renormalization parameters, you change the model. Yeah. And in so far, you cannot divide it out because mm -hmm. these are physical different theories. Okay. Yeah. So so yeah. so, so that's. Uh, I, don't think that this is an option. Okay, many thanks. Okay, I see a further raised hand by Dinjo O'Connor. Uh, yes, uh, thank you for a nice talk. And I'm wondering about the renormalization more generally. Sometimes uh, theories are not renormalizable perturbatively, but are renormalizable non perturbatively. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, is there additional insight uh, into that? And uh, the second part is in four dimensions, I don't know of any renormalizable non trivial field theory. The five yeah. theories presumably doesn't exist non perturbatively. So, what, what can you say on these, these issues? Just yeah, I, I'm afraid I cannot say much about this because it's certainly something one does not know precisely. Yes, yeah? so, so, um, um, yeah, no, I, I, do, I think I cannot, cannot really answer this. I think these are very interesting and questions one should better understand, but, um, I'm, very far from giving an answer. Okay, thank you. That's <laughs> all. Maybe I can ask a question. Hello. Um, Hello. So your the Lagrangian entered your formalism. Yes. So what happens when you change that by a total derivative? Uh, nothing. It's only the equivalence class of the Lagrangian which enters, which enters the structure. And if there's a boundary term? No. Uh, the, the reason is that we, when we look at this relation, this dynamic relation, we change the Lagrangian by adding a function with compact support. And uh, th these boundary terms would always be uh, outside of this support of this uh, change psi. So, uh, so this, this uh, um, difference, this difference of Lagrangian does not see the boundary terms. It's the same as looking at the Euler-Lagrange equations. Thank you. Okay. Any further questions? Stefan, some final words? Uh, yeah, you could give the final words. Well, uh, well I can give them. Um, well, thanks to Klaus again for this 
uh, first uh, for this uh, uh, for getting us started here with a nice presentation. We'll uh, continue this. Obviously, um, the idea was uh, to have uh, one such colloquium uh, uh, every six months or so, and uh, we'll keep you posted about uh, any any new uh, colloquia coming up in the series. Thanks again, Klaus, for 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 uh, being here. Yeah, thanks for the attention. Well, <laughs> <laughs>